Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Hadith 95 Talking about the believers seeing their Lord in the Akhirah From Suhaib that the Prophet said إِذَا دَخَلَ أَهْلُ الْجَنَّةِ الْجَنَّةَ قَالَ يَقُولُ اللَّهُ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى تُرِيدُونَ شَيْئًا أَزِيدُكُمْ فَيَقُولُونَ أَلَمْ تُبَيِّضْ وُجُوهَنَا أَلَمْ تُدْخِلْنَا الْجَنَّةَ وَتُنَجِّنَا مِنَ النَّارِ قَالَ فَيُكْشَفُ الْحِجَابُ فَمَا أُعْطُوا شَيْئًا أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّظْرِ إِلَى رَبِّهِمْ عَزَّ وَجَلْ The Prophet said, when the people of Jannah will enter Jannah, Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala will say to them, do you want anything more that I should give you? They will say, have you not whitened our faces? Have you not entered us into Jannah and saved us from the fire? Then the hijab of Allah will be removed and the people of Jannah would not have been given anything more beloved to them than to look at their Lord, Azza wa Jal. And also in another wording, the Prophet recited the ayah, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا الْحُسْنَى وَزِيَادَةً For those who do good, there will be goodness as a reward for them and an increase. This is Surah Yunus, ayah 26. So we take from the narration then that this increase which is being talked about in the ayah is explained by this hadith and the increase is that they will see their Lord and this will be the seeing of pleasure specific only to the people of Jannah. On the plains of Yawm al-Qiyamah, the Muslims and the Munafiq will both see their Lord, but it will not be the seeing of pleasure. It will be the seeing of examination to test them. Will they follow Allah Jalla wa'ala or someone else they do not recognize? So Allah will show himself, but in an image that they will not recognize. And the Muslims will refuse to follow because they will say we are waiting for our Lord. But this is something that the Munafiqeen will also see. So it will not be a looking of pleasure. And this idea of the Muslims seeing their Lord in Jannah has reached a mutawatir level of narrations. Hence the scholars have said that the one who denies that the Muslims will see their Lord in the Akhirah has become a kafir. There are many other references in the Qur'an, like in Surah Qaf, لَهُمْ مَا يَشَاءُونَ فِيهَا وَلَدَيْنَا مَزِيدٍ They will have whatever they want in it, meaning in Jannah, and with us there is an increase. So this increase is referring to seeing Allah Jalla wa'ala. Likewise, the saying of Allah, إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةً That these faces will be looking at their Lord. Likewise, he's saying about the kuffar, كَلَّا إِنَّهُمْ عَنْ رَبِّهِمْ يَوْمَ إِذٍ لَمَحْجُوبُونَ Nay, they will be blocked off from their Lord that day. So if they will be blocked off, then it means that the Muslims will not be blocked off. Otherwise, this ayah would make no sense. Likewise, Allah saying, عَلَى الْإِرَائِكِ يَنْظُرُونَ On high couches looking. And this includes looking at Allah, as well as other things. As for Allah Jalla wa'ala saying to Musa alayhi salam, لَن تَرَانِي You will not see me. Then this is specific to this world. It is similar to how Allah Jalla wa'ala says about the Yahud, وَلَنْ يَتَمَنَّوْنَهُ أَبَدًا بِمَا قَدَّمَتْ أَيْدِيهِمْ And they will never wish for it because of what their hands have earned. Meaning they will never wish for death because they love their life too much. But in the Akhirah we know that the Kuffar, and this includes the Yahud, are going to say to Malik, the gatekeeper of Jahannam, يَا مَالِكُ لِيَقْضِ عَلَيْنَا رَبُّكُ O oh Malik, ask your Lord that he should put an end to us, meaning give us permanent death, because that would be better than enduring the punishment. So here in Jahannam they are going to wish for death. But Allah says they will not wish for death in the other ayah. So the way to understand it is that they will not wish for death in this world ever, because of what their hands have earned. As for the statement of Allah, لَا تُدْرِكُهُ الْأَبْصَارُ وَهُوَ يُدْرِكُ الْأَبْصَارُ that the vision cannot encompass him, but he encompasses all of vision, then there's a difference between looking at Allah and encompassing Allah with your vision. The people of Jannah will look at him. They will not be able to encompass Allah with their vision. So there is no evidence in this ayah that the people of Jannah will not be able to see Allah Azza wa Jal. And the people of Bid'ah who say that the Muslims will not see Allah, they say that if you see Allah, it means that he is a body, like a physical body. And a physical body needs to be something which newly comes into existence and seeing as though Allah does not newly come into existence he is not a body hence he cannot be seen but this reasoning of theirs clearly goes against the text and we simply say to them no this is not correct just because you can see Allah does not mean that he is a body rather we go by what the text is teaching us and this suffices us and even using this word to describe Allah body this is not something which we find amongst the early Muslims so even this word now is a new invention when it comes to speaking about Allah Jalla wa'ala. So we should refrain from using it. We did mention that Aisha radiallahu anha in the narration previously, she used this ayah that the visions cannot encompass him. 
to prove that the Prophet did not see Allah Jalla wa'ala. But we said before that we disagree with Aisha using this ayah to prove that you cannot see Allah Jalla wa'ala. Rather, the only thing this ayah proves is that you cannot encompass Allah with your vision, which is different to you seeing Allah. And Aisha is a human being. She can make her ishtihad and she can be correct or incorrect. For example, we know that even though she is incredibly knowledgeable and a scholar of Islam, but she opposed the fact that the dead person is inconvenienced when the living people cry over him. And she used the ayah that no soul shall bear the burden of another to prove that this is not the case. But we know that we have the authentic narration which says that the dead person is punished because of the wailing which the living people do over him. And we said that punishment does not mean that he's being punished because of something wrong which he's done. Rather punishment in this case means an inconvenience. Likewise, Aisha opposed the idea that if a grown-up woman was to pass in front of a person who is praying, then this breaks his prayer. She opposed this, whereas we find this ruling in an authentic hadith. So the point is that she is not perfect, even though she is incredibly knowledgeable. And the ummah owes her a debt because of all the knowledge which she passed down to us. So what about these people of bid'ah who deny that the Muslims will see Allah Jalla wa'ala? Is it permissible for us to make dua against them and say, Oh Allah, do not make these people see you in Jannah. The point is, because these people themselves believe that Muslims will not see Allah in Jannah, then for us to make this dua against them would not actually be an oppression against them. Because this is what they believe in the very first place. Hadith 96, talking about how the Muslims will see Allah Jalla wa'ala. This hadith is long, so let us go into the translation. From Abu Huraira, the Prophet was asked by the people, Will we see our Lord on Yawm Al-Qiyamah? The Prophet asked them, هَلْ تُضَارُّونَ فِي رُؤْيَةِ الْقَمَرِ لَيْلَةَ الْبَذَرِ Do you have to push and shove and injure each other in order to see the moon on the night of the full moon? They said, No, O Messenger of Allah. Then he asked them, هَلْ تُضَارُّونَ فِي الشَّمْسِ لَيْسَ دُونَهَا سَحَابِ Do you have to fight or injure each other in order to see the sun when there is no cloud? They said, No, O Messenger of Allah. So the Prophet replied, فَإِنَّكُمْ تَرَوْنَهُ كَذَلِكَ like that, you will see him, meaning as clearly as that. Then the hadith goes on. The Prophet says that Allah will collect the people on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And Allah will say, whoever was worshipping something, then let him follow that thing. So everybody follows their own God. So those who worship the sun would follow the sun. Those who worship the moon would follow the moon. And those who worship the false gods will follow their respective false gods. Until this ummah will remain along with its munafiqoon. Because remember, they were outwardly showing their Islam. And this is the way they will be doing it on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Then Allah will come to them in an image other than His own. And He will say, I am your Lord. And they will reply, we seek refuge in Allah from you. We will stay here until our Lord comes to us. And when our Lord comes to us, we will recognize Him. And then after that, Allah will come to them in an image which they will recognize. And He will say, I am your Lord. And they will say, you are our Lord. And they will follow Him. And then the sirat or the bridge will be set up over Jahannam. And the Prophet said, I and my ummah will be the first ones to cross over this bridge. And that day nobody will be speaking except the messengers. And their da'wah or their call that time will be, Allahumma sallim sallim. Oh Allah, keep us safe, keep us safe. And he says that in Jahannam, there will be long pincers like the thorns of Sa'dan. He asked them, have you seen the thorns of Sa'dan? They replied, yes, Messenger of Allah. So he said they will be like the thorns of Sa'dan except that nobody knows their size except Allah. So these hooks or pincers will seize the people because of their evil deeds. And so from the people will be those who will be destroyed because of their actions and from those who will be rewarded until they are saved. And this is because of their good deeds. Until Allah finishes judging between the slaves and he wants to take out from his mercy whomsoever he wants to take out from the people of Jahannam. He will order the Malaika and they will intercede and take out people from Jahannam and only those who did not commit shirk will be taken out and they will be taken out by the mercy of Allah. They used to say La ilaha illallah and so the Malaika will recognize them in the fire. They will recognize the marks of their sujood. The Prophet said, تَأْكُلُ النَّارُ مِنْ ابْنِ آدَمَ إِلَّا أَثَرَ السُّجُودِ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَى النَّارِ أَنْ تَأْكُلَ أَثَرَ السُّجُودِ The fire will consume all of Ibn Adam, meaning the children of Adam, except the marks of their sujood. Allah has made it haram for the fire to consume the mark of the sujood. So this would be your forehead, your nose, your hands, your knees and your feet. 
which you use to perform the sajda on. So these people will be taken out of the fire, they will be looking like charcoal, and they will be put into the water of life, and they will sprout forth, just like a grain sprouts forth on the side of a flood. Then Allah will finish the judgment between his slaves, and there will remain a man facing the hellfire. He is going to be the last person to enter Jannah. He is going to say, O oh my Lord, remove my face away from the fire, because its air has poisoned me, and its blaze has burnt me. And he will make dua to Allah for as long as Allah wants him to make dua. And then Allah will tell him, perhaps if I did this, you will ask me for something more. And he will say, I will not ask you for anything else. So Allah will give him what he wants, on the condition that he will not ask for anything else. Then this man will move towards Jannah, and he will keep quiet, for as long as Allah wants him to keep quiet. And then he will say, My Lord, put me forward towards the door of Jannah. And Allah will say, Did I not give you what you wanted on the condition that you will not ask for anything else? Destruction upon you, O Ibn Adam, how treacherous you are. But the man will say, O my Lord, and he will keep making dua. And Allah will say, Perhaps if I give you this, you will ask me for something else. And he will say, No, by your honor, I will not. So Allah Jalla wa ala will give him what he wants, on this condition that he does not ask for anything else. And he will put him near the door of Jannah. So when he reaches near Jannah, the gate will be opened, and he will see inside Jannah, and the bounty and the pleasure of it. And he will remain quiet as long as Allah wants him to. Then he will say, O oh my Lord, enter me into the Jannah. And Allah will say, Did I not give you what you wanted, on the condition you will not ask me for anything else? Destruction to you, O Ibn Adam, how treacherous you are. But this man will keep on calling on Allah, and he will say, Do not let me be the most treacherous of your creation. And he will keep on making dua, until Allah will laugh. And when Allah Jalla wa ala laughs, he will tell him, Enter Jannah. And when he will enter Jannah, Allah will tell him, Make a wish. And so he will do so, and Allah will remind him of his desires of such and such things. And when his desires will be exhausted, so he's run out of what he wants to wish for, Allah Jalla wa ala will tell him, You will have whatever you wished for, and the like thereof. Abu Huraira has reported this hadith, and Abu Sa'id al Khudri was listening to this, and he differed, he said that this man will have what he wished for, and ten times thereof. And Abu Huraira said, but I remembered from the Prophet that it would be the like thereof. So it appears that there is a difference of opinion between Abu Huraira and Abu Sa'id al Khudri. And Abu Huraira would say that this man mentioned in the hadith was the last person to enter Jannah, meaning he was least deserving. So we can take from this long narration that the Muslims will see their Lord as clearly as they see the moon on the night of the full moon or the sun when it is not cloudy. But before entering Jannah, the Muslims and the Munafiqun will see Allah but in the form of examination. And we are also told that Allah Jalla wa ala will come to them. So this idea of Allah coming to them is not like how a human being might come to you. It is from the descriptions of Allah and it befits His Majesty. And we don't know how it manifests. But one might ask here that Allah is coming to them in a different image. So does the image of Allah change then? We say no, the image of Allah Jalla wa ala does not change. So he's not some sort of shapeshifter. But the vision of the people as they will see Allah Jalla wa ala will change. We could be accused of tahrif at this point. But we can say that this is not tahrif, rather it is ta'wil. Because we do have a need to take the word away from its apparent meaning. Because we do not say that Allah is a shapeshifter. The narration talks about the sirat. It has been described as a bridge which is thinner than a hair strand and sharper than a sword. And it has also been described as a bridge which has these thorns or these hooks which will pull you away from the bridge and plunge you into the jahannam underneath. The narration talks about when Allah finishes the judgment between the people, He will have the malaika take the disobedient Muslims out of jahannam. So this tells us then that Allah Jalla wa ala does what he does in a particular order. Otherwise, is it difficult for Allah to do everything at the same time? We say no, it is not difficult for him. But he chooses to do it in order, in accordance with his wisdom. From this narration, we find a rebuttal against the Khawarij and the Mu'tazila. They say that anyone who goes to Jahannam will never come out. But this hadith clearly refutes that. That the evildoers of the Muslims will come out of Jahannam. And it also shows us that those people who used to pray will be in Jahannam, at least a portion of them anyway, because the fire will not consume the marks of their sujood. These are the seven bones on which you prostrate. They will not be consumed by the fire. So it shows us the importance of prayer. 
it will be responsible for taking people out of Jahannam and also reducing their punishment in Jahannam in that these places will not be consumed by the fire hence the punishment will be lighter so even though you are praying it is not a guarantee you will not enter Jahannam but the prayer is a cause for you to be taken out of Jahannam and this idea of crossing over the bridge will be the most stressful time on Yawm Al-Qiyamah because the prophets will be making dua oh Allah grant safety, grant safety and from the story about the last man to enter the Jannah we take that the desires of man they have no limit because once this man is given what he asked for he wants more and more we also take from this hadith that from the attributes of Allah is that he can laugh and this is a real laughing which befits him only the Mu'attila they say that the laughing of Allah means that he wants to reward the person but this is not what laughing means rather him wanting to reward the person is a result of his laughing at them so there are two different things one is the consequence of the other so therefore you cannot explain the first by using its consequence clearly they are two different things similarly how they would say that the anger of Allah means that he wants to punish them no we say that him wanting to punish them is a consequence of his anger but it is not the same thing so on the plains of Yawm Al-Qiyamah the people will be of three types the first one will be those who will not be held back and they will be thrown into Jahannam along with their false gods second type the people of the book they will be held back but as a means of rebuke against them and to show them how they were on the wrong path and following the wrong deen and thirdly you have the mu'minun along with its munafiqun and they will see Allah Jalla wa ala. it appears three times during this phase once they will see him in an image in which they would recognize him then Allah will come to them in an image which they will not recognize and then after that he will come to them in the original image which they would recognize but all three of these types of viewing are not the viewing of pleasure because the munafiqeen will also see Allah in this way it's also mentioned in the narration that the saq or the shin of Allah will be uncovered there are two interpretations of this from the early Muslims the first interpretation is that the word saq does not mean shin rather it means the strength or the power of Allah and this is because Allah does not link the word saq or the shin to himself he does not say the saq of Allah rather it just says saq that the saq would be uncovered if he linked it to himself then we would have to say no this means the shin of Allah the second interpretation is that it means the shin of Allah Jalla wa ala, but this is a shin which befits him we can also take from the narration the honor of Allah Jalla wa ala to the Muslims in that he will take them out of Jahannam and these people in Jannah they will be called al Jahannamiyun, those people who have come from Jahannam but it is also reported that these people would want this title removed from them and Allah will remove it from them in another wording of the narration it says that the Yahud will be asked what did you use to worship and they said we would worship Uzair the son of Allah and they will be told you have lied Allah never took a wife nor a child and they will be asked what do you want and they will say we are thirsty we want to drink and upon this they will be thrown into Jahannam and gathered together all there and the Christians will be asked what did you use to worship and they said we would worship al Masih, the son of Allah and they will be told the same thing you have lied Allah never took a wife nor a child what do you desire they say we are thirsty so give us to drink and upon this they will be all gathered together in Jahannam and the other narration also mentions some detail about how the people will cross the bridge he says that from the believers will be those who cross the bridge like the blinking of an eye or like a lightning strike or like the wind or like the bird flying in the air or like fast race horses but from the people there will be those who would be saved some will be saved but will be scratched and others will be piled up in Jahannam but as for the believers who will be piled up in Jahannam their brothers who will be saved from Jahannam they will say to Allah our Lord they used to fast with us and they used to pray with us and they used to make Hajj with us so Allah will say to them take out whomsoever you recognize and so the believers will take out their brothers from the fire and they will say we have taken everybody out and Allah will tell them return whoever you find with a dinar amount of goodness in his heart take him out so they will do that and they will return they'll say we have taken everybody out and Allah will say return and whoever you find with half a dinar of goodness in his heart take him out of the fire and so they will do that then Allah will say return and whoever you find with a small ant's weight of goodness in his heart take him out of the fire and so they will go and take out a great portion of people 
And Abu Sa'id al Khudri, who is reporting this, at this point in the hadith, he says, And if you don't believe me about this hadith, then recite the ayah if you want to. Inna Allah la yazlimu mithqala dharratin wa intaku hasanatin yudha'ifha wa yu'ti min ladunhu ajran azima. Verily Allah does not oppress even to the weight of a small ant. And if there is any good deed, he will multiply it and he will give from himself a great reward. Surah An-Nisa, Ayah 40. And at that point Allah will say, The Malaika have interceded, the Prophets have interceded, the believers have interceded. And now no one remains except the most merciful of those who show mercy. And Allah will take out a fist load of people from the fire who have never done any good. And they will be looking like charcoal. And they will be put into the river of life. And they will sprout forth just like a grain sprouts forth on the side of a flood. So we can take from this part that these Muslims in Jahannam were people who used to fast, pray and perform the Hajj. But still they are in Jahannam. This is because your life is not just about the ritual acts of worship rather. Islam is a complete way of life. So maybe these people, whilst performing their acts of worship, were also those who were backbiting, committing other major sins, cheating, lying and being dishonest with other people. And you see this much amongst Muslims, that although their acts of worship is fine, but the way they deal with other people is horrendous. Okay, now what about this difference between Abu Huraira, who heard twice the amount, and Abu Mas'ud, who heard ten times the amount that you wish for? Well, it's possible that they heard two different occasions. So on one occasion, it was twice the amount for one type of person, and for another type of person, it would have been ten times the amount. This is possible. But if we assume they're talking about the same occasion, then it's possible that one misremembered, as they are humans after all. Or it may even be that at first the Prophet mentioned twice the amount, and then later on he increased it to ten times the amount, where Abu Huraira heard twice the amount, but did not hear ten times the amount, and Abu Mas'ud heard the ten times the amount part. Well, the point is, whether it's twice the amount or ten times the amount, entering Jannah is what really matters. And so twice or ten times is not the major detail. And yet still, they take each other to task over even minor, non-essential details. This is how particular they were in remembering a hadith. Also notice this episode about this man. Firstly, his face turned away from Jahannam, then being brought to the gates of Jannah and then seeking to enter Jannah. So three phases and he's asking Allah Jalla wa ala. Allah Jalla wa ala loves to be asked. And it is not that Allah was reluctant to enter him into Jannah. But through this episode Allah Jalla wa ala is showing us that the desires and the wants of mankind are never ending. You always want that much more. And it is only Jannah that will truly satisfy the wants of man. Because just like man's desires, Jannah is also infinite. Hadith 97 about the intercession and the people of Tawheed being taken out of the fire. From Abu Sa'id al Khudri, the Prophet said, يُدْخِلُ اللَّهُ أَهْلَ الْجَنَّةِ الْجَنَّةِ يُدْخِلُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ بِرَحْمَتِهِ وَيُدْخِلُ أَهْلَ النَّارِ النَّارَ ثُمَّ يَقُولُ أُنْظُرُوا مَنْ وَجَدْتُمْ فِي قَلْبِهِ مِثْقَالَ حَبَّةٍ مِنْ خَرْدَلٍ مِنْ إِيمَانٍ فَأَخْرِجُوهُ فَيُخْرَجُونَ مِنْهَا حُمَمًا قَدْ امْتَحَشُوا فَيُلْقَوْنَ فِي نَهْرِ الْحَيَاةِ أَوْ الْحَيَاءِ فَيَنْبُتُونَ فِيهِ كَمَا تَنْبُتُ الْحَبَّةُ إِلَى جَانِبِ السَّيْلِ أَلَمْ تَرَوْهَا كَيْفَ تَخْرُجُ صَفْرَاءَ مُلْتَوِيَةٍ He says that Allah will enter the people of Jannah into Jannah and he will do so for whomsoever he wills with his mercy and he will enter the people of the fire into the fire then he will say look to see whoever has a mustard seed worth of Iman and take him out of the fire. So these people will be taken out of the fire, they will be looking like charcoal, and they will be put into the river of life, and they will sprout forth, just like a seed sprouts forth on the side of a flood. The Prophet says, did you not see how the seed sprouts, and it is yellow and curved? You will find many narrations of shafa'a or intercession, where the Prophets are interceding, the believers are interceding, and the Malaika are interceding and taking people out of the fire, and also Allah taking people out of the hellfire. And the collectors of a hadith would collect these hadith in order to refute the khawarij, who were many at that time. And they would say that whoever goes into Jahannam will not be taken out. And this is the belief of the khawarij and the mu'tazila. And these narrations are a rebuttal against them. 
And this narration is also telling us that there will be Muslims who will enter the fire, even though they were performing their acts of worship. So the Muslim must realize it is not just his acts of worship which he needs to focus on, it is other things as well. But we do find the virtue of Tawheed in that it has the power to take you out of Jahannam. Hadith 98, talking about the last person to leave the fire. From Abdullah bin Mas'ud, the Prophet said, إِنِّي لَأَعْلَمُ آخِرَ أَهْلِ النَّارِ خُرُوجًا مِنْهَا وَآخِرَ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ دُخُولًا الْجَنَّةِ I know the last person to be taken out of the fire and the last person to enter the Jannah. رَجُلٌ يَخْرُجُ مِنَ النَّارِ حَبْوًا A man who will exit the fire crawling on his knees. فَيَقُولُ اللَّهُ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَ لَهُ إِذْهَبْ فَدْخُلِ الْجَنَّةِ So Allah will tell him go and enter Jannah. فَيَأْتِيهَا فَيُخَيَّلُ إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهَا مَلْآ He will go to it but he will imagine that it is filled up. فَيَرْجِعُ فَيَقُولُ يَا رَبِّي وَجَدْتُهَا مَلْآ So he will return and he will say My Lord I found it filled up. فَيَقُولُ اللَّهُ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَ لَهُ إِذْهَبْ فَدْخُلِ الْجَنَّةِ So Allah will tell him go and enter Jannah. فَيَأْتِيهَا فَيُخَيَّلُ إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهَا مَلْآ So he will go to it and he will think that it is filled up. فَيَرْجِعُ فَيَقُولُ يَا رَبِّي وَجَدْتُهَا مَلْآ So he will return and he will say, My Lord, I found it full. فَيَقُولُ اللَّهُ لَهُ إِذْهَبْ فَدْخُلِ الْجَنَّةَ فَإِنَّ لَكَ مِثْلَ الدُّنْيَا وَعَشْرَةَ أَمْثَالِهَا So Allah will tell him, Go and enter Jannah because you will have similar to this world and ten times its like. فَيَقُولُ أَتَسْخَرُ بِي أَوْ تَضْحَكُ بِي وَأَنْتَ الْمَلِكُ And this man will say, Are you mocking me or laughing at me whilst you are the king? And Ibn Mas'ud says, I saw the Prophet laughing until his teeth could be seen. And it was said that this person has the lowest status in Jannah. In this hadith we learn of the immense bounty of Allah Jalla wa'ala. In that the lowest status of Jannah will have the like of this world and ten times its amount. And what is amazing is that everyone in Jannah will think that he has been given the best possible prize. As for the highest part of Jannah, Al-Firdaus, then this is something which Allah has planted with His own hands. In the same way He has created Adam with His own hand, He wrote the Torah with His own hand. As for the other creations of Allah, He did not make it with His own hand, rather, He created it by saying, Kun, be, and of course it is. This man will think that Jannah is full because he will be the last person to enter Jannah. So he will think that everybody has taken their place, so there is no more room left for me. But of course, the bounty of Allah is limitless. And from this hadith also, we can take a comparison between the luxuries of this life and that of the hereafter. In other words, there simply is no comparison. If the lowest status in Jannah is ten times this earth. Hadith 99 from Abu Dhar, the Prophet said, إِنِّي لَأَعْلَمُ آخِرَ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ دُخُولًا الْجَنَّةِ وَآخِرَ أَهْلَ النَّارِ خُرُوجًا مِنْهَا I know the last person to enter Jannah and the last person to leave the fire. رَجُلٌ يُؤْتَى بِهِ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ A man who will be brought on يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ فَيُقَالُوا اِعْرُضُوا عَلَيْهِ صِغَارَ ذُنُوبِهِ وَارْفَعُوا عَنْهُ كِبَارَهَا It will be said, display his minor sins for him, but keep away from his major sins. Meaning don't display them. فَتُعْرَضُ عَلَيْهِ صِغَارُ ذُنُوبِهِ فَيُقَالْ عَمِلْتَ يَوْمَ كَذَا وَكَذَا كَذَا وَكَذَا وَعَمِلْتَ يَوْمَ كَذَا وَكَذَا كَذَا وَكَذَا It will be said to him, you did on such and such a day, such and such an act. And on such and such a day, you did such and such an act. فَيَقُولُ نَعَمْ لَا يَسْتَطِيعُ أَنْ يُنْكِرْ He will say yes, and he will not be able to deny it. وَهُوَ مُشْفِقٌ مِنْ كِبَارِ ذُنُوبِهِ أَنْ تُعْرَضَ عَلَيْهِ And he will be fearful that his major sins will be presented to him. فَيُقَالُ لَهُ إِنَّ لَكَ مَكَانَ كُلِّ سَيِّئَةٍ حَسَنَةً فَيَقُولُ رَبِّ قَدْ عَمِلْتُ أَشْيَاءَ لَا أَرَاهَا هَا هُنَا It will be said to him, you will have in place of every evil deed a good deed. And he will say, my Lord, I did things which I did not see here. In this hadith, we find evidence that your major sins can be forgiven without you repenting from them. Because this is a man who clearly did not repent from his sins. Because if he repented from his sins, then his sins would not be displayed before him. Because we know that repentance will erase your sins. So it will be as if you did not commit sins. But this man now is the last person to leave Jahannam. He committed minor sins and major sins. But Allah, through his mercy, did not even present his major sins to him. He forgave it straight away. As for his minor sins, they were presented, but they were changed into good deeds. And this is the power of Tawheed. So does this hadith coincide with the ayah of Surah Al-Furqan? 
which talks about those people not associating partners with Allah and not killing an innocent soul and not fornicating and whoever does this will be met with the reward but Allah goes on to say إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا Except the one who repents and he believes and works righteousness, then they will be the ones that Allah will change their evil deeds into good deeds and Allah is the forgiving the merciful. We say no, these are two different evidences because the ayah in Surah Al-Furqan is talking about those who repent. This hadith in front of us now is talking about the one who did not repent. Because if he had repented from these sins, they would not be presented in front of him, and he would not be taken to account. Hadith 100, talking about the intercession, from Anas ibn Malik, the Prophet said, يُخْرَجُ مِنَ النَّارِ مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَكَانَ فِي قَلْبِهِ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ مَا يَزِنُ شَعِيرَةً ثُمَّ يُخْرَجُ مِنَ النَّارِ مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَكَانَ فِي قَلْبِهِ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ مَا يَزِنُ بُرَّةً ثم يخرج من النار من قال لا إله إلا الله وكان في قلبه من الخير ما يزن ذرة The one who said لا إله إلا الله and he had a barley grain worth of goodness in his heart will be taken out of the fire. And then the one who said لا إله إلا الله and he had in his heart a wheat grain of goodness in his heart will be taken out of the fire. And then the one who said لا إله إلا الله and he had in his heart a small ants weight of goodness in his heart will be taken out of the fire. We mentioned before that the scholars of hadith, such as Al-Imam Muslim in this case, have reported many a hadith pertaining to the shafa'ah or the intercession, that the believers will be taken out of Jahannam. And they're doing this particularly as a rebuttal against the Khawarij and the Mu'tazila, who were rampant in those days and still are, and they believe that the people of Jahannam will be in there forever and nobody will be taken out. So based upon this, the Muslim who commits a major sin is a kafir and if he does not repent and dies upon this, then he will be in Jahannam forever. Because nobody can be committing a major sin and still be a Muslim at the same time. For them, it's just black and white. You're either here or there. Of course, this is not the opinion of the Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah. The one who commits a major sin is still a Muslim and will be taken out of Jahannam and even his major sins will be forgiven, as we saw in the previous hadith. As for their evidence which they bring forth to say that the people of Jahannam will be in there forever, then their evidence, as always with the people of Bid'ah, is not muhkam, rather it is mutashabih, which means it can carry two or more meanings of equal weight. So in other words, this evidence is unclear and you cannot justifiably derive a ruling from it. For example, they use the ayah of the Qur'an, كُلَّمَا أَرَادُوا أَنْ يَخْرُجُوا مِنْهَا أُعِيدُوا فِيهَا Every time they want to come out of it, meaning out of the fire, they will be returned to it. Likewise, Allah saying, وَكَذَلِكَ يُرِيهِمُ اللَّهُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ حَسَرَاتٍ عَلَيْهِمْ وَمَا هُمْ بِخَارِجِينَ مِنَ النَّارِ Thus will Allah make them see their deeds as a grief for them, and they will not leave the fire. Likewise, Allah saying about the people of Jahannam, وَمَا هُمْ بِمُخْرَجِينَ And they will not be taken out. So all of these ayat are pertaining to the kuffar. They are not pertaining to the Muslims who will be in Jahannam. Because we have other evidences which tell us that the Muslims will be taken out. So the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they take into account all of the evidences. As for the Ahlul Bid'ah, they will just give weight to the evidence which supports their cause. This is the difference between Ahlul Sunnah and Ahlul Bid'ah. This hadith talks about the fact that those people who took the shahada will be taken out. But of course we need to know that the shahada is not just lip service, rather it has conditions. So a person may take shahada, but he may do other things which take him out of the fold of Islam and turns him into a kafir. And the main action here is not praying your prayers. So you absolutely do not pray, meaning every day you pray precisely zero prayers. So if a Muslim reaches this sort of level, then he is a kafir and must be treated as such and he needs to be given advice to come back onto the deen and start praying. Hadith 101 of the same chapter about the intercession. This is the long hadith about the Ash-Shafa'atul Uzma, the greatest intercession. Let's go into the translation of this. From Abu Huraira, he says that some meat was brought to the Prophet one day, and the foreleg of the animal was given to the Prophet, and the Prophet would love this part of the animal, and he began to eat it and bite from the meat. And he said, 
انا سيد الناس يوم القيامه i will be the leader of mankind on yawm al qiyamah and then he asks the companions do you know why that would be and then he says that allah will collect the first of the people and the last of the people on one plane on yawm al qiyamah then a voice would be heard by all of them and everyone will be able to see and the sun would come near and people would then experience anguish and agony which they will not be able to bear then some people will say to the others do you not see in which trouble you are Do you not see the misfortune which has overtaken you? Why don't you find someone who would intercede for you with your Lord? So some of them would say, "Go to Adam," and they would go to Adam, and they would say, "Oh Adam, you are the father of mankind. Allah created you with His own hands and breathed His spirit into you, and He ordered the angels to prostrate before you, intercede for us with your Lord." Do you not see what trouble we are in? Do you not see what misfortune has overtaken us? Then Adam would say, Verily my Lord is angry to an extent which he had never been angry before, nor will he be this angry afterwards. Verily he had forbidden for me to go near that tree and I disobeyed him. Myself, myself, meaning I am only concerned with my own self. Go to someone else, go to Nuh. So they would go to Nuh and they would say, O oh Nuh, you are the first of the messengers sent on earth. and Allah has called you a grateful servant intercede for us with your lord do you not see what trouble we are in do you not see the misfortune which has overtaken us and then nuh would say verily my lord is angry today as he had never been before and will never be this angry afterwards and there was a dua which i made against my people i am only concerned with myself you'd better go to ibrahim and so they will go to ibrahim and they will say to him you are the prophet of allah and his khalil meaning someone extremely beloved to him intercede for us with your lord do you not see what trouble we are in do you not see the misfortune which has overtaken us ibrahim would say verily my lord is angry today as he has never been before and he will never be after this and ibrahim will remember his lies and he will say i'm only concerned with myself myself you'd better go to someone else go to musa and so they will go to musa and they will say oh musa you are the messenger of allah allah blessed you with his message and his speech above the people intercede for us with your lord do you not see the trouble we are in do you not see the misfortune which has overtaken us and musa would say to them verily today my lord is angry like he has never been and will never be after this and i once killed a man whom i had not been ordered to kill i am only concerned with myself myself you'd better go to isa so they will go to isa and they will say o oh, isa you are the word which allah sent upon maryam and a spirit from allah so intercede for us with your lord do you not see the trouble we are in do you not see the misfortune which has overtaken us and isa will say my lord is angry today like he has never been and will never be after this and isa however mentions no sin of his and he will say i am only concerned about myself myself you'd better go to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so they will come to him and they will say o oh muhammad you are the messenger of allah and the last of the prophets allah has pardoned all your previous and later sins intercede for us with your lord do you not see the trouble we are in do you not see the misfortune which has overtaken us and then the prophet said i shall then set off and come below the throne of allah and fall prostrate before my lord then allah will reveal to me and inspire me with some of his praises which he had not revealed to anyone before me and then he would say muhammad raise your head ask and it will be granted intercede and your intercession will be accepted then he says i would then raise my head and say oh my lord my people my people and then it will be said oh muhammad enter into jannah from your umma those people who will have no account to give and these people will enter from the right hand door from the doors of the jannah and they will also share with the other people some other doors besides this door meaning this door on the right which is the special door for the people who will have to give no accounting and the prophet said by the one who has the soul of muhammad in his hand the distance between the two sides of the doors of the doors of jannah is like the distance between makka and hajar or he said between makka and busra hajar in bahrain busra in iraq so this hadith talks about the ash-shafa'atul uzma the greatest shafa'a or the greatest intercession 
which is the intercession for Allah Jalla wa ala to pass judgment on the people. Because on the plains of Yawm Al-Qiyamah with the sun coming near and the people sweating and are in all sorts of distress, they will not be able to bear it and they would want Allah to pass judgment so that all of this can be done and dusted with. So they won't need to suffer this stress on the plains of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And so from this hadith we find that no prophet will be able to make this intercession except the last prophet. So these people first of all go to Adam salam, and they make mention to these prophets something of great virtue. So because of this virtue the prophet would have a right to make intercession. So in other words this prophet would be qualified to make intercession. But Adam says that he is not qualified to make intercession and the sin which he mentions is that he ate from the tree and he disobeyed Allah Jalla wa ala. And from this it becomes known that the story about Adam making dua to Allah to give him a healthy child and shaitan comes to Adam and he says you need to name your child Abdul Harith the slave of Al Harith and so when their child was born they named him Abdul Harith thus committing shirk because they named their child as being the slave of Al Harith and Al Harith is not one of the names of Allah so this story is a fabrication because if Adam did commit this sin, then this sin is far greater than eating from the tree. So therefore, it would be more worthy for Adam to recall this sin rather than eating from the tree. And you will find more details on this issue in our presentation of Kitab al-Tawheed. And this also illustrates that prophets can commit sins, but with certain parameters. It is possible for a prophet to be upon shirk before his prophethood, because before the message reaches you, there is no blame upon you, even if you were upon shirk. Because Allah does not take to account anyone for committing shirk or kufr before the message reaches them. As for after prophethood, it is not possible for a prophet to be upon shirk or any form of kufr. Neither does a prophet ever commit major sins, nor does he ever commit any sin which would detract from his prophethood, for example, lying or cheating or being devious in some sort of way. So these are impossibilities for a prophet. It is possible for a prophet, however, to commit a one-off minor sin. But if he commits this minor sin, Allah Jalla wa ala will notify him and the prophet will repent from it. So in the end, he will not have any sins to his record. And this is what Adam did. He disobeyed Allah Jalla wa ala. He himself says in this hadith, فَعَصَيْتُهُ then I disobeyed him. Allah Jalla wa ala also says in the Quran, وَعَصَى آدَمُ رَبَّهُ فَغَوَى And Adam disobeyed his Lord and went astray. So the word Asa is important here. It means to disobey or be disobedient. We take from the narration that Allah Jalla wa ala created Adam with his own hand. And Adam is the only human being to be created by the hands of Allah Jalla wa ala. Allah says to Iblis in the Quran, مَا مَنَعَكَ أَن تَسْجُدَ لِمَا خَلَقَتُ بِيَدَيَّ أَسْتَكْبَرْتَ أَمْ كُنْتَ مِنَ الْعَالِينَ What prevented you, O Iblis, from prostrating to the one whom I created with both my hands? Were you too proud, or did you consider yourself to be too high? We take that Adam السلام, was not a messenger, because we find that Nuh السلام, was the first of the messengers to the people of the earth. However, was Adam a prophet? The answer is yes, due to the authentic hadith, Adamu Nabiyun Mukallam. Adam is a prophet who was spoken to, meaning by Allah. So based upon this, there is a difference between a prophet and a messenger. And the difference is that a prophet is given the message of Allah Jalla wa ala, meaning that of the Sharia, and he delivers it to a people who are already upon Tawheed. As for a messenger, he too is given the message of Allah Jalla wa ala, of the Sharia, so he's given this inspiration, just like a prophet, but he is now going to deliver this message to a people who are going to oppose him. So we find therefore the first of the messengers to the people of the earth was Nuh alayhi salam. And we know from the Quran, only a very very minority of the people followed him. And most of them were drowned. We find from this narration the virtue of Nuh alayhi salam. Allah Jalla wa ala calls him in Surah Al-Isra, إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا Verily, he was a grateful slave. He mentions an act which makes him too ashamed to intercede for the people. He says he made dua against his people. And he's referring to the ayah of the Qur'an when Nuh said, 
Rabbi la tadar ala al-ardi min al-kafirina dayyara. O Lord, do not even leave one kafir living on this earth. So you can see, after 950 years of giving da'wah and being completely rejected, Nuh alayhi salam has the right to be annoyed. However, this dua of his was somewhat extreme and so he feels ashamed because of this dua to intercede for the people and he feels he's not worthy to do so. He tells them to go to Ibrahim and the people go to him and they say that you are the Khalil of Allah. Khulla is the highest form of love. It comes from the root letters Takhallul which means when you seep through something. As the Prophet said, وَخَلِّلْ بَيْنَ أَصَابِعْ And wash in between the fingers when he's giving the instructions for wudu. So this is a type of love which seeps through your body. It is the purest form of love. And Ibrahim attained this because he was prepared to sacrifice his own son for the sake of Allah Jalla wa'ala. And not just any son, his only son, which makes it even more difficult to do so. And also Ismail was at that age when a son and a father have a strong bond between each other. So this would make it even more difficult. But lo and behold, Ibrahim alayhi salam passed this unbearable test. However, even Ibrahim being the Khalil of Allah will feel too shy to make intercession and he will recall the times when he did not speak the truth. But these lies of his were more equivocations, half-truths, which he did for a particular purpose. So this is not counted as a serious sin. So if it is not a sin, then why didn't Ibrahim intercede? It's because Allah Jalla wa'ala on this day will be the angriest he has ever been. And so because of this, even Ibrahim will have such a fear of Allah that he will feel himself not worthy to intercede and even the minor of mistakes will be magnified for him on this day. The incidents which he is referring to, these are all recounted in the Qur'an, but firstly, when the night covered him, he saw a star and he said, هَذَا Rabbi, This is my Lord. But he only said this in order to make the people realize that this star which he is going to set cannot be the Lord because my Lord does not go away. And this star is going to set. The second incident, when he broke the idols, and the people came and asked him who did it, and he told them that your big idol, which is still standing there, he broke them. So go and ask him. Of course, Ibrahim broke them, but he wanted to teach the people a lesson that this idol you're worshipping cannot even speak to you. So how is he now worthy of worship? So all this time you're worshipping him, but when you really need to ask him about something, so you need to ask him who broke the other idols, this major idol of yours cannot reply, and he cannot help you in aught. The third incident, when his people were going out to celebrate their shirki celebration, Ibrahim looked at the star and he said, I am sick, so he cannot attend their celebration. Yes, it's true, he was sick, but not physical sickness, he was sick of their idolatry. They will then go to Musa alayhi salam, and they will mention his special qualities, that Allah has written the Torah for him, and he has spoken to him, and Musa was chosen above the mankind during his time. But he will feel he is not worthy, and he will recall the fact that he killed an innocent man. And the story of this is found in Surah Al-Qasas, when he found two people fighting. One was the Egyptian, and the other one was from his tribe, from the Bani Israel, who called for his help. And Musa was a strong man, he struck the other person and killed him. So this was a mistake, and Musa, because of this, will feel he is not worthy to intercede. So then they will go to Isa alayhi salam, and Isa alayhi salam is a spirit from Allah, which means... He is a spirit which Allah created and blew into the womb of Maryam alayhi salam. But he will not make mention of any mistake he made, but he will feel he is still not worthy for this intercession. And so then they will go to the last prophet and he will be the only one worthy of this intercession. So this is why the prophet will be the leader of mankind on Yawm al-Qiyamah. Notice here though, that Allah Jalla wa'ala could have inspired these people to go to the last prophet in the first instance. But he didn't. Why is this? This is in order to show that the last prophet is superior to all the other prophets before him. And in particular, these prophets to which these people go to, except for Adam alayhi salam, the other prophets are from the Ulul Azm, the prophets of firm will. Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa and Isa. Alayhim are all from the Ulul Azm, 
as well as the last prophet. So we find here that the Ulul Azm are being compared and that the last prophet is the superior one out of the Ulul Azm. These are the five superior prophets out of all of them. We take from the hadith that there can be no shafa'a, no intercession, except by the permission of Allah Jalla wa'ala. This is why the Prophet will have to go beneath the throne and he would have to prostrate and he would have to call upon Allah using a specific dhikr which Allah will teach him. So from this we can find that Allah can give knowledge to some people which he does not give to others. So it's all about which doors of knowledge Allah Jalla wa'ala opens up for you. Just going back to the beginning of this hadith, we find that the Prophet is eating from the foreleg of an animal. And he would like this part of the meat because it was a lot more tender. And we can take therefore that when you are eating, you can speak. So there's nothing wrong with socializing as you are eating. Because the Prophet is telling this hadith here as he is eating. This does not mean to say that you speak with your mouth full, because this is seen to be rude in most places, but speaking around a dinner table or around a plate of food is permissible. Hadith 102, this is a variation of the last narration. The Sirat is also mentioned, which is the bridge across Jahannam, and it mentions that some will cross this bridge like the lightning, and some will be like the blinking of an eye, some will be like the wind, some will be like the bird, and they will cross in accordance with their deeds. And the Prophet will be standing there saying, Rabbi Sallim Sallim, My Lord, grant safety, grant safety. And some people will be crossing the bridge, crawling. And there will be some hooks or pincers on the side, and they are going to snatch people off the bridge. And if you get snatched off the bridge, then you know what is below you. So from this, we can take an extremely valuable practical lesson, which is to increase in your good deeds and decrease in your evil deeds, because... Crossing over the bridge on Yawm Al-Qiyamah will be the most stressful time on the plains of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, without a shadow of doubt. So if you want to cross this bridge at the speed of lightning, then you need to make sure you have plenty of optional good deeds in your record, because the speed at which you cross will be dependent on your good deeds. So make sure you perform extra nawafil acts of Salah, Salat Al-Tahajjud and Salat Al-Duha should be plentiful in your lives. Make sure you perform extra fasting. And especially during the winter time, fasting will be easy. So these are easy rewards for you to pick up. Make sure you perform extra dhikr of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Memorize little adhkar and ad'iya, which you can perform throughout the day. Give in extra charity, especially if you have performed a sin. Because we know that charity extinguishes the sins. Like water would extinguish the fire. Make sure you have a daily Quran recitation plan that you go through a certain amount of Qur'an every day because the Qur'an is the best type of dhikr. So the point is, have a plan of good deeds for every day because this is the way you will be motivated to perform extra acts of worship if you have a plan. And crossing over this shirat is not going to be fun because Jahannam is going to be below you and you don't know whether these pincers are going to pull you off the bridge. Note that in other narrations of the Shafa'at al uzma the order in which the people go to the Prophet is different. So we say that the correct order is in the narration which you have mentioned, and if the order in other narrations is different, then this is not talking about the chronological order, rather it is just talking about the Prophets which they will go to, but not necessarily in that particular chronological order. Hadith 103 from Anas ibn Malik, the Prophet said, أنا أول الناس يشفع في الجنة وأنا أكثر الأنبياء تبعا The Prophet said, I am the first of mankind who will intercede for people to enter Jannah and I will have the largest followers out of all the Prophets. And in another wording, أنا أكثر الأنبياء تبعا يوم القيامة وأنا أول من يقرأ باب الجنة I will have the most followers out of all the Prophets on يوم القيامة and I will be the first one to knock on the door of Jannah. And this is also a specific shafa'a for the Prophet. He will make intercession for the doors of Jannah to be opened. As he says, he will be the first one to knock on the door of Jannah. This is because after the people have crossed the bridge, the Sirat, they will find the doors of Jannah to be closed. And this will require a further intercession by the Prophet to have these doors opened. So now we find two specific types of intercession for the Prophet. The first one is the intercession for the judgment to be passed. And now in this narration, the second specific intercession for the doors of Jannah to be opened. We also know of the third specific intercession, which is 
that he will intercede for his uncle Abu Talib for his punishment in Jahannam to be reduced. So he'll be put in the shallowest part of Jahannam. As for the intercession to take people out of the fire, then as we have mentioned before, this will be for the believers, for the prophets, for the malaika, and also Allah Jalla wa'ala himself will take the believers out of Jahannam. We may also take that having a large and a righteous following is a positive attribute because then you share in the reward of the righteous actions which they perform. Hadith 104 about the special dua of the Prophet which he has kept hidden for his ummah to intercede for them. From Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍ دَعْوَةٌ دَعَى بِهَا فِي أُمَّتِهِ فَاسْتُجِيبَ لَهِ وَإِنِّي أُرِيدُ إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ أَنْ أُؤَخِّرَ دَعْوَةِ شَفَاعَةً لِأُمَّتِي يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ he said every prophet had a dua which he made in his ummah and it was answered. And I, inshallah, want to delay this special dua of mine as an intercession for my ummah on yawm al qiyamah. So from this hadith, we find the intelligence of the prophet. Every prophet is given a special dua which must be answered. This is a privilege which every prophet has, and quite rightly so. So the last Prophet, instead of using up this special privilege of his during his lifetime, he has saved it for Yawm Al-Qiyamah. It is as if he knows that this Ummah will be in desperate need of his intercession on that day. So just look at the foresight and the intelligence of the Prophet ﷺ. So how can a Muslim not have anything but pure love for the Prophet? That he loves the Prophet more than his own self and his family and his wealth and the whole of mankind. But otherwise, we know that the Prophet made many ad'iya during his mission as a Prophet, and they were answered. But the dua which he's talking about here is the extra special dua which every Prophet is given, and this dua is always answered. He also says in a wording, فَهِيَ نَائِلَةٌ إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ مَنْ مَاتَ مِنْ أُمَّتِي لَا يُشْرِكُ بِاللَّهِ شَيْئًا This intercession will help those who did not commit shirk from my ummah. So we find that there will be Muslims taken out of Jahannam. Hadith 105, the Prophet making dua for his ummah and crying out of compassion for them. From Amr ibn al-As, he says that the Prophet recited the ayah from Surah Ibrahim, Rabbi innahunna adhlalna kathiran min nas faman tabi'ani fa innahu minni. My Lord, they have misguided many from the people. So whoever follows me, then he is from me. Up to the end of the ayah. That's ayah 36 from Surah Ibrahim. And he also read the ayah. إِن تُعَذِّبَهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ عِبَادُكْ وَإِن تَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ فَإِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ If you punish them, then they are your slaves. And if you forgive them, then verily you are the mighty, the wise. And then the Prophet raised both his hands and he said, اللهم أمتي أمتي O oh Allah, my ummah, my ummah. And he started to cry. And Allah said, O oh Jibreel, go to Muhammad and your Lord knows better and ask him what is making him cry. So Jibreel went and asked him and Jibreel informed Allah, although Allah is better knowing. And Allah told Jibreel, go to Muhammad and tell him, Inna sanurdika fi ummatik wa la nasu'uk. We will please you regarding your ummah and we will not grieve you. So from this narration we take the immense compassion the Prophet had for his ummah. And also we take the kindness and the honor of Allah Jalla wa'ala in that he will not leave the Prophet disappointed about his ummah. And it is because of this compassion he had for his ummah, it is the duty of every Muslim to defend the honor of the Prophet and to promote his cause and his deen and to promote his sunnah and to demolish every type of bid'ah. It's the least we could do for the Prophet. We can also take from this hadith that when you make dua, you raise your hands, just as the Prophet did here except on occasions in which we have evidence that you don't raise your hands. For example, if you're entering the lavatory, you make dua and seek refuge from the shayateen, but here you do not raise your hands, because this is what is apparent from the narration pertaining to this topic. We can also take that this hadith is a good news for this ummah, in that this ummah as a whole is not going to go astray like the previous nations, because the Prophet was fearing that this ummah will turn out like the previous nations. And Allah tells him, no, this will not be the case. Hadith 106, the one who dies upon kufr will have no shafa'ah. And even if he's related to somebody pious, this would not benefit him. From Anas, 
he says that a man came to the Prophet and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, where is my father? And the Prophet said, Finnar, he is in the fire. And when the man turned around and went away, the Prophet called him and he said, Inna abi wa abaka finnar. Verily my father and your father are in the fire. In this narration, this man asked the question to the Prophet which was not fitting to be asked. Because this is a type of question which if the answer is made plain to you, it will grieve you. And so we can only imagine that when the man learnt of the answer, he must have felt in straitened circumstances that his father is in the fire, and there is literally nothing that he can do about it. So he just turned away. But when the Prophet saw him in this state of grief, the Prophet gave him some solace and he said, But you're not the only one. Rather, I am in the same boat as you are, in that my father and your father both are in the fire. And so we find there is nothing the Prophet can do about the fact that his father is in the fire. And this hadith is clear in stating that the father of the Prophet is in the fire, and these close relations do not hold any weight with Allah Jalla wa'ala. Somebody may say, but the father of the Prophet was from the Ahlul Fatra, the period in which there was no Prophet sent. We say, yes, but there were still remnants of the deen of Ibrahim alayhi salam, so the truth was still out there for them to accept it and search for it, this is what Waraqah ibn Nawfal did. He left the shirk and paganism and he embraced Christianity because in that religion there were scriptures. So after this hadith, it is difficult to argue that the parents of the Prophet are in Jannah. And this is what many Muslims try to do. They try to say that the parents of the Prophet died as Muslims and they are in Jannah. But this hadith is clear cut. And we have to take it on the apparent meaning. And anyone who tries to interpret it any other way needs another evidence from the Qur'an and the Sunnah to justify his interpretation. In Sahih Muslim also, the Prophet was forbidden from seeking forgiveness for his mother, and yet he was allowed to visit her grave, which only has to mean that his mother too is in Jahannam. And we have to follow what the text teach us, not our emotions. Hadith 107 about the statement of Allah and warn your nearest kindred. From Abu Hurairah, he says that the ayah was revealed to the Prophet وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ And warn your nearest kindred. Surah Al-Shu'ara, ayah 214. The Prophet got up on a mountain and he said, O Quraysh, buy yourselves from Allah. I cannot avail you in aught against Allah. O children of Abd al-Muttalib, I cannot avail you against Allah. O Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib, I cannot avail you against Allah. O Safiya the paternal aunt of the Messenger of Allah, I cannot avail you against Allah. O Fatima, daughter of the Messenger of Allah, ask me whatever you want, I cannot avail you in aught against Allah. So from this narration we find the Prophet would obey the ayat of the Qur'an and the orders of Allah Jalla wa'ala. We take from this that it is permissible to give a kafir some wealth because the Prophet is saying to Fatima, Fatima asked me whatever wealth you want, but I cannot avail you against Allah in aught. And so those kuffar who do not fight you on account of your deen, then you should treat them with goodness. As Allah says in Surah Al-Mumtahana, Ayah 8, لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم إن الله يحب المقسطين And making bir to the kuffar means showing grace to them. So you can give them gifts and you can give them wealth and you can treat them in a nice way. And also if they treat you good, then you should treat them good in return. And this is qist or justice. And Allah loves the muqsitin, those who are just. We also take from this that da'wah begins from the home. Make sure you give da'wah to your family members first. They are upon the deen. As the Prophet was ordered to warn his near family members first. And Allah says, Qū anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Save yourselves and your families from a fire. So when you are giving da'wah, family comes first. And in another wording, the Prophet told his people that if I told you that there is an army approaching from the other side of the mountain, will you believe me? They will say, yes, we have never heard a lie from you. So the Prophet replied, so I am warning you that there is a great impending torment coming your way. And so upon this, Abu Lahab, one of the uncles of the Prophet, said, destruction be to you. Did you gather us all together for this? And so in response to this, Allah sent down the ayah, Tabbat yada Abi Lahabin wa tabba. And the surah is famous. We can learn from this 
a good technique of argument in which you have to lay down foundations in which you secure the agreement of the one you're addressing. Because in one of these narrations, the Prophet said, if I were to tell you that an army is approaching from behind this mountain, would you believe me? And then they said yes. So he secured their agreement that the Prophet is truthful. So if you find the Prophet to be truthful, then also believe when he tells you that he's a messenger, warning you of an impending doom. So in other words, lay the foundations of agreement first before making your point. In another authentic narration, Umm Sulaim, the wife of Abu Talha, did something similar when she informed him that his son had died in infancy. She said, what do you say about a person who gives you his wealth to borrow and then he takes it back? Is there any blame on him? Abu Talha replied, of course, there's no blame on him. And then she said that Allah Jalla wa ala has taken your son from you. Hadith 108 about the intercession of the Prophet for his uncle Abu Talib. From Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, he asked the Prophet, O Messenger of Allah, have you benefited Abu Talib in anything? Because he used to protect you and become angry for you. The Prophet replied, Naam, huwa fi dahdahin min nar, wa lawla ana la kana fi darkin asfali min al nar. Yes, he is in the shallow part of the fire, and if it was not for me, he would be in the lowest depths of the fire. So this hadith makes an exception to the general rule as given in the Qur'an, فَمَا تَنْفَعُهُمْ شَفَاعَةُ الشَّافِعِينَ So no intercession of the intercessor will benefit them. Talking about the kuffar. So here is a type of exception in that even though the Prophet will not be able to bring Abu Talib out of the fire, but he will be able to reduce the punishment. So this is a type of intercession, and it is one of the specific intercessions given only to the Prophet. And we take a valuable lesson from this hadith, in that it is permissible for you to say, if it wasn't for me, then such and such would have happened. And this is not classified as shirk, because somebody cannot say, no, actually, it was because of Allah that such and such happened. And the reason why we say it is not shirk is because if you truly were the cause of a particular result, then this is permissible. For example, here the Prophet is saying, if it wasn't for me, he would be in the lowest depths of the fire. This is because the Prophet is the cause for Abu Talib to be in the shallow part of the fire. Hence, we can divide this up into three types. Number one, if the cause is well known. So this is not shirk, just as in this hadith here. Number two, if the cause is not very well known. So it may well be a genuine cause or it may not be. So this could possibly fall into shirk. And type three is if you know that this is not the correct cause. For example, somebody saying, if it was not for this pious saint in his grave, we would not be given rain, because this pious saint made dua to Allah to grant us rain. This is absolute shirk, because we know for a fact that this pious saint in the grave has nothing to do with the rain falling. There is a narration from Ibn Abbas, he said that if somebody says, if it was not for the duck in the house, the burglar would have entered. And Ibn Abbas classified this as shirk. But we say this is not shirk. Rather, Ibn Abbas is trying to block off the roots which may lead to shirk. Otherwise, if somebody does say something like this, and it was the duck which started to quack, which repelled the burglar from the house, then certainly the duck was responsible for repelling the burglar, and this sentence would not be shirk. But Ibn Abbas is being on the safe side and wants to block off any root leading to shirk. What about if somebody says, if it was not for Allah and such and such a person, the burglar would have entered. This is shirk because you are putting a human being on the same level as Allah. Rather, what is correct is that you can say, if it wasn't for Allah and then such and such a person, the burglar would have entered. This is correct. What is also shirk is having your heart attached to the cause instead of Allah Jalla wa ala. Because this is tawakkul and tawakkul is ibadah and that can only be for Allah. So if your heart is attached to the guard dog guarding your property, so that means you're making tawakkul on the guard dog. And that is shirk. Hadith 109, which is linked to the last hadith from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, the Prophet said, Inna adna ahl al-nari adhaban yanta'ilu bina'alayni min narin yaghli dimaghuhu min hararati na'alayhi The person with the least punishment in the fire will be the one wearing two sandals of fire and his brain will boil because of the 
heat intensity of these sandals. So this hadith is referring to Abu Talib because this is the least punishment for anyone in Jahannam. So this hadith as well as the last one is a rebuttal against the Rafida who say that Abu Talib is not in the fire. And the point about this punishment as well as all punishments in the fire is that everyone in hellfire will believe that he is being punished the worst. And this makes sense because if the people of hellfire know that there are other people who are being punished worse than they are, then this will be some kind of relief for them. And relief is a good thing. And you're not allowed to have anything good in Jahannam. Often in this world, it is a relief for us to know that other people are suffering the same as what we are suffering. But in Jahannam, this will be of no relief to them. Even if they know that other people are suffering the same as them, this will be no relief because of the intensity of the punishment. Allah Jalla wa'ala says, وَلَنْ يَنْفَعَكُمُ الْيَوْمَ إِذْ ظَلَمْتُمْ أَنَّكُمْ فِي الْعَذَابِ مُشْتَرِكُونَ And today it will not benefit you in aught to know that all of you are sharing in the punishment. So in Jahannam there will be no solace. We can say something similar about the people of Jannah. Everyone in Jannah will think that he has been rewarded the best of rewards. This is because if you know that somebody is enjoying Jannah more than you are, then this will cause you grief. And grief is not something which is possible in Jannah. Hadith 110, the one who dies upon kufr, his actions will not benefit him. From Aisha, she says, O Messenger of Allah, Ibn Jad'an, this is the name of man, in the time of Jahiliyyah, he would join ties of kinship, he would feed the poor. So is this going to benefit him? The Prophet replied, لا ينفعه إنه لم يقل يوما رب اغفر لي خطيئتي يوم الدين this will not benefit him because never once did he say, My Lord, forgive my sins on the day of resurrection. And for this ruling, we have many other evidences. Allah says in the Quran, وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا And we will come to whatever deeds they did and we shall turn it into scattered dust particles. He says, وَمَا مَنَعَهُمْ أَن تُقَبَلَ مِنْهُمْ صَدَقَاتُهُمْ إِلَّا أَنَّهُمْ كَفَرُوا بِاللَّهِ وَبِرَسُولِهِ And nothing prevented their charity from being accepted, except that they disbelieved in Allah and in His Messenger. We can also take from this hadith that there is nothing wrong with speaking good about a kafir who has passed away, if he is deserving of that. Because here Aisha mentions the good deeds of this person, Ibn Jada'an, he used to join ties of kinship and he used to feed the poor people. And he's worthy of this mention, therefore there is no problem with this. Is it permissible to abuse a dead kafir? There is no benefit in merely abusing a dead kafir or speaking ill of him, because there simply is no benefit. However, if it serves a particular purpose, then you can speak ill of a kafir. In fact, you can also speak ill of a Muslim because maybe this Muslim was a person of deviancy and he would be spreading deviant ideas. So this needs to be exposed. So we say in order to make the truth plain, you are allowed to speak ill of dead people. Because here now, a particular purpose is being served. Can we take from this narration that if a kafir says, then he becomes a Muslim? The answer is no. For the one who is able to, he absolutely must utter the shahadatain. Because if a person simply utters, My Rabb, forgive my sins on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, then these are words that could be uttered by a Christian and a Jew as well. And it does not really explicitly enter you into Islam in the unique sense, whereas the shahadatain do. So note the difference. End of track questions number one. Give the three specific intercessions for the Prophet ﷺ. Question number two. What's the evidence that there will be Muslims who used to pray and fast and perform hajj, but still they will be in Jahannam? Question number three. Give evidence that da'wah begins with the family. Question number four. Is it permissible to say, if it was not for me, then such and such would not have happened?